the people God loves and wants you to reach. God's love for them, that's his signature. God's work in their lives, that's his letter. Welcome to Teach Through the Word. This is the Bible Teachers Podcast. Chris Langham back with you again and on my own again. Jonathan and Peyton are out for this series. This week we are back in series two of our basic training for Bible teachers class. Now a little reminder, this class is a uh, whole separate project in and of itself, separate from this podcast. But here on Teach Through the Word podcast, we love giving away stuff for free. So we're giving you a preview version of the the basic training series. Now, series two of basic training is the calling of the teacher. We're on day two of series two, which means we have arrived at essentials of the preacher. Today's essentials are called and gifted. We're going to be back in second Corinthians. So if you got a Bible handy, please join me there. Let's get to it. Let me read the intro for us and then we will dive in. This is the Bible teachers podcast. We are here to teach you Sorry, we are here to equip you, Bible teacher, to do what you do better and together with you to elevate the craft of Bible teaching. Get equipped, get trained, and while you're at it, get a behind the scenes look, hear it through the word. You know, I notice I mess around a lot less when I don't have Peyton and Jonathan messing with me. Anyway, let's get to it. All right, today we dig in on essentials of the preacher. What does it mean to be called and gifted? We're back in 2 Corinthians again as Paul steps up to defend his calling and he explains who he is and with that, who we are and what we are as Christians in ministry. It's an incredible glimpse as Paul lays out his heart as he opens up and pours out the most powerful calling in the scriptures and picture of what it means to be called to ministry. In 520, we saw last time, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We are sent by God with a message. We represent Jesus. Back in chapter 2, verse 17, we saw, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Now, that applies to every Christian. But what about the Bible teacher in particular? What does it mean to be sent by God with a calling to teach? And how do you know if you have the gift and if God is commissioning you especially for this? And what do you do with that nagging feeling that you're not good enough? Those are our questions for today. We're going to start back in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And there we find that little phrase that still haunts me in verse 16. Who is equal to such a task? Now, if you've heard me tell the following story before, I apologize, but it is worth retelling. It is the the story of, of my calling, the day that I knew I was called to be a Bible teacher. I was sitting at a conference. It was the the Preach the Word conference. I'd been invited by my pastors to tag along. Now, I'd already been doing some Bible teaching. I I had the general calling, like everyone, to teach. So I'd been teaching at a a home group, and I'd been teaching where opportunity arose. I didn't wait for some special moment with God to begin teaching. However, I was seeking the Lord with all my heart for the direction for my life. I was working as an engineer couple years into that with my degree in mechanical engineering, working on launching rockets into space. But my heart all day, every day was just thinking about ministry and thinking about explaining God's word to other people. I remember I'd sit in Bible study that we had at my, uh, um, uh, at Boeing where I was working. We had a, a weekly Bible study and I love, this is my best part of my work week was just sitting there and opening up the scriptures with the, the other engineers who were there. And I found myself explaining so much to others. And it just felt like I would come alive when uh, we'd sit there and open the Bible and I would explain things to others. But did that mean a calling on my life? I really wanted to be sure. What was I going to dedicate my life to? Well, sitting at that conference, I remember hearing speaker after speaker talk about 
the calling to uh, to teach the word, to share the gospel. And they were talking in general about every Christian being called to 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 share. But there was also this special calling to preach the word. I remember the speaker was Tony Evans and he was uh, he was in Matthew at the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And uh, I remember I remember his whole study as he walked through the the Great Commission by uh, that uh, as they gathered together, that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Therefore, go. And I remember as I sat there, I don't remember what point in the message, but somewhere in that message, something clicked in my heart. The Holy Spirit just gave that confirmation. You are called to this to preach the gospel, to preach God's word. And as I sat there, I felt so contented for about, I think it was maybe two minutes or more. (laughs) And it suddenly struck me, I can't do that. And it wasn't a false humility thing. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not good enough, Lord. But okay, if you twist my arm. It was a genuine and sober recognition of self. I can't do that. Not only am I not worthy of it, I'm not an incredible speaker. It was sort of the Moses moment standing at the burning bush. Lord, I'm not gifted in speaking. And, you know, I I done a little bit of teaching and explaining. Some stuff came naturally. But what those guys did on the stage in the pulpit, I knew what was happening up there. It wasn't just explaining what was here in the Bible. The Holy Spirit stepped into that. And when they opened God's word, God's word spoke to me that right there. I can't do that. So message ended. I was sitting in there in my, there in my chair and I hung out for a couple minutes with these, these two completely opposing thoughts. I am called to teach God's word and I can't do it. What do I do with that? Well, I'll get back to that story, but back here in second Corinthians, just after Paul makes that grand statement in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. We move now to chapter three at verse one, chapter three, second Corinthians verse one. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need like some people letters of recommendation to you or from you. All right. This was actually one of the key issues that apparently the super apostles, the the new teachers that had come in and tried to kick Paul out while he was away. These guys brought up that Paul didn't have any letters of recommendation, official letters on Christian company letterhead with the fish logo at the top saying that Paul was commissioned by the apostles. And apparently they showed up with some sort of letters of recommendation, letters that they claimed made them legit. Now, the tricky part is some of the false teachers had these so-called letters of recommendation. They carried documents saying that they were legit, but they weren't legit. What do you do with that? And why didn't Paul have letters? I mean, he's Paul, the apostle. He'd already been at this point approved by the the, the council, the, the, the leaders in Jerusalem, Paul shares that story in Jerusalem, in, uh, in Galatians. Why doesn't he carry around letters recognizing that, that he is a legit apostle? Paul's response says a whole lot about what legitimizes our authority to teach in church. Verse two, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. The most important letter of recommendation that you have as a teacher is the one from God himself. But where does God write his letter? What does his signature what does his signature look like? Read the verse carefully. You yourselves are our letter. The people God loves and wants you to reach God's love for them, that's his signature. God's work in their lives, that's his letter. But where does he write the letter? Read it carefully back in verse 2, written on our hearts. Paul is speaking. See, God writes his letter of recommendation, endorsing his servant on the heart of the teacher. 
His love for the people engraved on your heart. Paul had that. Do you have it? And how does anyone read it? I mean, can't you just say, well, I got you. God's love written on my heart. Back in verse two, read with me. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. It should be visible, evident. When you love people, I mean genuinely love with the love of God, it's usually pretty obvious. Does it look like talent or eloquence in speaking? Does it sound like engaging or funny? Nope. It usually sounds like love. It looks like God's love poured out through you. Now, Paul also says in his letter to Titus that a leader should be able to teach. That is a necessary skill for a teacher. You need the ability. But that ability is not the letter of recommendation. Plenty of awful leaders are talented teachers. Doesn't mean they're called. Back in verse 3, read with me. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Wow, what a verse. God's signature. The medium is not ink. It is God's Spirit. The canvas is not paper or stone. It is the human heart. And if it's real, anyone can read it. Look at verse 4. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Confidence. Back in my story. Sitting in the back of the room, I was stuck in my chair with two certainties in my mind. I'm called to teach God's word and I can't do it. Study ended and I just sat there torn. A little time passed, so I got up and I remembered there's a resource area in the back of the room. Maybe I can get some training, some equipping. Something there will make me good enough. You know, competent for the calling. This is a serious calling. I saw a Bible college brochure. Opened it up, and I remember looking through it thinking, I just graduated with my engineering degree. I would love to go back to college, but I can't. I've got a baby. I've got a wife. I've got, I think at that point, I even had a mortgage already. I flipped through the college uh, Bible college brochure and saw some interesting classes, some prices, considered do I have the time? And then I flipped to a page and the entire page was filled with just two verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That was it. That is the only way you're good enough, or I'm good enough. For me, that was also God's confirmation. I found that verse in my Bible, circled it, marked it up, got the date next to it. God's confirmation that I indeed had a special calling, that I was being sent, as Peyton puts it. Sent to whom? I didn't know yet, but I knew that this was my direction for life. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was writing it on my heart. God wrote his love for his people on my heart by his Spirit, and he confirmed it for me with a verse that I have held on to to remind me of two things. I am called to this, and I will never be sufficient on my own. I am competent not in myself, but God has made me competent, not by the letter, but by the Spirit. Now, was it enough to just feel that really strongly? No. Verse 2 says that when the Spirit writes that letter of commendation, Everyone can see it, not just you. In verse 3, it says that it is seen in the results of our ministry, in the people. That's why in church, we have a confirmation of calling with the laying on of hands, with the prayer, with the, the sending by the elders, by the leaders of the church. We don't just call ourselves to it or just say, I have a calling, I'm going to go do this. We allow God to use the authority structures that he set up in our church to confirm the calling. 
But this was how I knew. God gave me a verse and I held on to it. And it had meaning. It had calling. It had purpose. And it had God's sufficiency for me. So that is the calling and how I read it in the Bible. But what about gifting? The preacher must be called and gifted. So what does it mean to be gifted to teach? Well, for that, I want to quickly turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Remember that Hebrews told us that every mature Christian should have the ability to teach. Not just those called. The ability to teach goes for every mature Christian. And Titus tells us, Paul's letter to Titus, that the ability, that ability to teach is a requirement for any elder. The occasion is going to come up. Every elder is going to have times where they need to teach others. So they need to be able to teach. Paul reminds Timothy that he must rightly handle the word of truth. All of those calling, all of those uh, uh, exhortations are for any leader in the church. But what about the specific gifting of the teacher? Now we find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Now, here we have a separation of various leadership gifts, and one of them is the teacher. But notice the phrasing in the verse. Here, in this case, Paul doesn't refer to the gift of teaching being given to the teacher. He says that Christ gave the teacher to the church. Now, that's a crucial difference. God's gifts are not to you. They are through you. The teaching talent is not, is not a gift of God to you for your own sake. You are the steward of God's gift given to the church for their sake. God wraps up the teaching gift in you and gives you to the church. For what purpose? Read verse 12 to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So how do you know if you have the gift to teach? Is in verse 12 is that burden of, of is that the burden of your heart? Read verse 12 carefully. To equip his people for works of service. Do you long to see the church equipped, the people ready to serve and able to work? The body of Christ built up until, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is the burden on the heart of every gifted Bible teacher. It's not a burden to be in the pulpit, not a burden to hear the applause or engage the audience. That is just your dumb old flesh. Ignore it. But if you long to see mature Christians finding unity in the faith, knowing Jesus and growing up to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, reformed in the image of their creator, and you know that you can explain and teach and preach God's word by the power of the spirit. And when you do teach it, that is exactly what happens. People grow. They mature. They are reformed into God's image. And of course, as you teach, there will be plenty of frustrations along the way as well. Yet the burden remains so that you persevere and you fan that gift into flame until you see his people grow up in unity and in the love of Christ. That is the gift of teaching. And that will do it for day two of basic training part two here. Thanks for joining us at Teach Through the Word. This has been the Bible Teachers Podcast. Tomorrow on day three, we will jump into the essentials of preparation as we walk through how you create message flow. And later this week, we'll cover knowing your authority and Bible storytelling. Five concise episodes in the series. Each week here at Teach Through the Word, we bring you one Bible book or one basic training essential or one teacher interview as we equip you, Bible teacher, to do what you do better and together with you to elevate the craft of Bible teaching. We'll see you next time.